audio jungle. I'm Pastor Kim. Welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ in Lyons, Illinois. Um, We are grateful that you are here to join us for our virtual service of worship online today, wherever you are. And as I say, every Sunday, wherever you are on life's journey, you are welcome here with us. So we have a few announcements this morning, and I will be back with you to lead us in our liturgy um, following the announcements. And our call to worship this morning. In the name of the Creator, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, gather at the mountain of God's holiness. Today is a day to celebrate God. Gather, aware of those you left behind to be here. Today is a day to stand in the gap between God and God's children. Gather to share God's presence. Today is a day of transformation for us and for God's world. Let us pray. Living God, at times it seems so distant. Help us know that you are near. At times we stray. Welcome us home. Standing in your presence, we know there are other people we could be with. Help us bridge the gap between your presence and the people we love. We pray in the name of Christ who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever, as we share now in this time of confession together. God pours blessings upon us even as we choose to go our own way. God is present and seeks to bring healing and wholeness to all. So therefore, let us be together in confession of all that would separate us from God or one another. Let us pray. When we have fashioned our own idols of desire or worshiped the temples of our own tradition, Lord have mercy. When we have denied your invitation to the banquet of love and justice, or fail to extend that invitation to others. Christ, have mercy. When we have adorned ourselves with worry rather than joy, or failed to be gentle, knowing you are near, Lord, have mercy. Now, friends, remember that our God loves, loves all, is love, embodies love through us and how we care and treat for one another and we are forgiven let us now share that love and forgiveness as the way that we do faith the way that faith is usually concerned today is it's a a psychological concept we think of faith as this thing that happens in our head it's a belief. It's an intellectual assent, and um, um, and then we, we because we think of it as an intellectual concept, people tend to assume that the more certain you are, the stronger your faith is. Um, Makes sense. That's what, well, that's the general assumption, and so then doubt is a sign of weak faith. And we talk this way, like you know, oh, so and so just has such strong faith. They've never once doubted the Bible's God's word, uh, or so and so has such strong faith. They just know they're going to get healed. They're certain of it. And so then what happens is we have kind of this thing where certainty becomes a virtue and doubt becomes a vice. So you create a culture of people who are striving for certainty, uh, trying to convince themselves uh, that, that what they believe is right and trying to suppress all doubt. And that creates all sorts of weird things like people get learning phobias because you don't want to read broadly because you might read it, come across something that's going to call your faith into question. Um, and it's really weird because the people who are good at this tend to be simple people or 
especially self-delusional people, they have no trouble believing, being certain of things that aren't real. And the people who tend to be poor at this are people who are balanced and more rationally minded, skeptical minded, which makes you wonder why did God, you know, stack the decks against the balanced, rational people and in favor of the delusional, simple people. It just isn't fair. Um, but that's the model of faith. So people are just trying to convince themselves of this. Um, and what's really, I mean, the thing that's really curious about it is that I, I think it's a form of idolatry because what ends up happening is people's security and sense of being special before God and having worth comes not from their actual relationship with God, but it comes from how certain they feel about their beliefs about God. And that leads to all sorts of weird things because people who are certain of their beliefs and never will question anything can't possibly learn anything. You can't learn anything or change if you're not willing to doubt that what you already believe is maybe wrong. Maybe wrong. Uh, before you can ever get a new belief, you have to question your old beliefs. But if you're, if, if you're invested, if a source of life is for you to remain certain that what you got in eighth grade was the whole truth and nothing but the truth, well then, um, you, there's no way for that to ever grow. You, you're stuck with that. Which I, I've met people who can be really bright PhDs in different areas of their life, but when it comes to talking theology, all of a sudden it's like talking to an eighth grader because they've insulated that all their life. They're always protecting that. But what I don't understand is how these animals could have been on earth millions of years before man and the Bible says the whole earth was created in only six days. That's why they get, so many religious people get angry when you try to dialogue with them about their, their beliefs. Um, if you disagree with them, they can get really angry because their identity, their life, is found in trying to remain certain that what they believe is true. So the more plausible an objection you raise, the more they're going to operate out of their amygdala, uh, their fight or flight reflex, uh, their prefrontal cortex, which does all the rational thinking, almost completely shuts down and they operate out of their, their amygdala. What was that? Where is that? The pre prefrontal lobe cortex. The amygdala is kind of more towards your reptilian brainstem. All that kind of thing. Well, you know, it's a, it's a proven fact that uh, we now have proven this neurologically that when people who are passionate about beliefs are presented with uh, factual claims that disagree with them, um, their prefrontal lobe cortex, which does all the rational thinking, almost completely shuts down and their amygdala gets activated. And when they're presented with alleged facts that agree with their passionate beliefs, the prefrontal lobe cortex shuts down almost as completely and the pleasure centers of the brain get activated. Which just shows that we're kind of hardwired to be narrow-minded. We love it when we find things that agree with us about beliefs that we're passionate about and hate it when we find things that disagree when we have to suffer cognitive dissonance. Which is one of the reasons why this country is becoming so polarized, because now people can choose the version of reality uh, that they want based on cable news, and uh, they tend to choose the one that gives them pleasure and avoid the one that makes them ticked off and gives them pain. So they get more and more narrow in their perspective. Now, if you add to all that the quest to be certain, you know that that's a virtue in and of itself. Well, you have that narrowness on steroids, and that's one of the reasons why I think conservative Christians have a justifiable reputation for being rather narrow-minded. Uh, the thing is, the Bible doesn't have a psychological concept of faith. Um, it, it's not a psychological thing at all, it, it's a covenantal thing. And so when you think about faith, you always have to think of it in a covenantal terms, like a marriage. They just weren't as into their heads as we are. You know, we're very therapeutic, always trying to figure out you know, why we're so screwed up and who we're, who, who we're to blame for it or whatever. Um, th that wasn't their case at all. To them, faith wasn't a matter of what's going on between your ears, it's what you're willing to commit to. Uh, you have faith. How certain you are isn't important. It's, it's whether you're willing to act in the face of your uncertainty. Uh, will, you be, will you commit to trusting your covenant partner and, and walking trustworthy in relationship with your covenant partner, even though, of course, it's uncertain. There's always uncertainty, but that's why it's called faith. Um, and, and, and getting a kind of barometer of how certain or, or doubtful you are, it just wasn't an issue. In fact, throughout the Bible, you find God encouraging kind of that, that stuff. There's so many questions in the Bible that don't get answers. And yet they're in the Bible, which tells us God must really like him because he put him there. Um, he incorporated him into his word. And so he's not a God who's afraid of questions and afraid of thinking. He says, come let us reason. Uh, he never asks people to believe things just blindly. Um, he, he gave us minds and he tells us to worship with his minds. And the way we worship with our minds is by thinking. That's what, brain, that's what brains are supposed to do. And so um, I, I think he's a God who encourages us to think about things. And we don't have to be certain of everything. We're not called to be the group that is certain of all having all the right answers. Uh, that's an idolatrous club. Uh, we're called to be a people who just, in the face of uncertainty, commit to living a certain way and imitating Jesus and living in his love and cultivating a relationship with the living God.
biblical faith and with magical faith. You know. Well, you know, biblical faith is a commitment to live a certain way in the face of uncertainty. Magical faith is like this modern concept of faith where the more certain you are, the more goodies you're going to get from God. You know, so if you get, if you're 50% certain, well then you, you meet the minimum bar of salvation. So now you're saved, which means you're not going to hell. But if you can get up to 75% certainty, well then you'll start moving in the blessing zone and God will help you get parking spaces. But if you get up to 90%, well now you're really starting a miracle zone. You can rebuke headaches and maybe even heal an ankle. But if you can get up to 100% certainty, well now you have mountain moving faith and you can do all things and, and have peace in the Middle East and solve your marriage problems. Maybe not your marriage problems, but at least peace in the Middle East. So um, it, it's all magical kind of thinking. In fact, in a lot of groups, if, if I can just be certain enough that I'm going to be healed, well then God guarantees me I will be healed. Uh, and that's that whole word faith kind of thing, which really backfires terribly because now when you don't get healed or your loved one doesn't get healed, uh, you got to blame the victim. It's, uh, I, I've seen that destroy people. But in, in less intense ways, it's operating all over the place. People have this idea that we were, we're, we're making deals with God. It's that whole contract legal thinking I, I mentioned before, where um, if um, here's the deal, if I just attain, attain a certain level of certainty, then the judge will acquit me. Uh, because of what the contract they worked out with the judge and the defense lawyer Jesus, and so uh, I, it's an exchange of goods. I give intellectual assent to this, and then I get salvation in return. Um, and it's, it's really far removed, opposite of a biblical concept of faith, which is not legal; it's covenantal. Uh, I give myself to you, and you give yourself to me. It's not about something we exchange between us. It's about our very lives being pledged towards one another, trusting and walking trustworthy in relation with another. There's so much magical thinking that's going on in Christian circles. All this, God, God works the universe in my favor if I just remain certain. I think God wants to get us a parking spot. I I, I, I'm sure he would like to give us parking spots. In the Bible prayed for saying not to like, kill people, and he did that. You don't think he would listen to me if I needed a parking spot? Well, you have to also think, money back. Have to think about this. Uh, you, you took this parking space. That means the old lady who could have used it more didn't get it. How's that? Or what about the... 90 million free decisions that agents made uh, that all influenced that parking space being open at that particular time and place. Greg, uh, just write God, the check. God's gonna... Just write the check, Greg. <laughs> Shut up. God's going to collapse all that just so you can have a part. And then it backfires. I, I, one lady I knew who... It was, her head was in a bad place and I finally got her to go to a counselor and uh, she went to the counselor but she couldn't find a parking space. So she had to park far away so she was late for her appointment and they couldn't take her then. And so, to her, that meant, this is another version of magical theology, God must not want me to go to counseling because she's so sure that God hates her. You know, so it's the tea leaf reading or the reading the face in the clouds. You know, whatever you're prone to believe, you're going to find. So she thinks God hates her. Well, no parking space means that God must not want her to get a, into counseling. So I said to her, so you're saying that God you know, controlled all the decisions that went into that parking space being taken or all the parking spaces being taken just so he could strike one at you so you wouldn't get counseling. That's a little bit... But God answers prayer. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. I don't get it, man. No, look, at but, but, but the question is, what does that mean God answers prayer? And that, that can be turned into a magical thing. Or if I just pray hard enough, pray long enough, pray this way or pray that way, well then God's going to have to come in and answer the prayer. And, and I, I, I don't buy in that at all. I don't think that's... But I, I, I had like a hundred people praying for my parking spot and that old lady only has one. You Might know, be unleashing more of that divine energy. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I do believe that you know, James says, James 5.16, that the prayer of the righteous is power, powerful and effective. And so I think that if you're praying with a sincere heart, it's powerful and effective in releasing a kingdom influence. If what we're praying for is God sees is stupid or just not good, um, I trust he's going to apply it in some other way, you know, because he knows we're stupid. Um, and so, but we're not creating uh, God's image. What? We're not creating God's image. We are creating God's image. We're just not created with God's wisdom, and we do a good job of screwing up the wisdom that we do have. You know, we're falling on top of everything. So uh, that that goes in the mix as well. It's it's fascinating how we can be so smart in some areas, like you know, the finding these you know the God particle and, and, and getting on the moon and all the technology. We can be so smart on all of this, and yet so profoundly stupid when it just comes to figuring out how to share resources and how to stop killing each other and so we spend you know hundreds of times more killing people than we do feeding people and that's just stupid it's it's proof of the fall I think
Today's lesson is from Exodus 32, verses 1 through 14. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us. Who shall go before us? As for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives and your sons and your daughters and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day and offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone so that my wrath may burn hot against them and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster on your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven, and all this land that I have promised I will give to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring. On the people. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation on all our hearts this day be pleasing to you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, What is it about idols that we are so drawn to? You know, I remember as a young girl, I was so uh, enamored by Sean Cassidy and Donny Osmond and Andy Gibb. Anybody remember the Bee Gees? Um, I had this poster of Sean Cassidy up on my door that was a life-size poster of him as if he were there in the room with me. Those were the teen idols, right, Um, of my younger years. I always seemed to be drawn more to musicians (laughs) than I was actors or anyone else. Um, And, you know, I think now um, for quite a few years, there's been this show, uh, American Idol, right, that's um, been the show to watch. And some of us may even know people that are artists that have auditioned and made it on to that show um, and that program. That concept of being an idol um, has really become an ultimate goal um, for many, Um, whether that's an idol in the world of acting or music or sports, even business and even in academia, right? Um, But today's scripture lesson in Exodus talks about this making of an idol. But what is an idol actually? Is it something like a statue or is it more than that? 
um, something to revere, something that holds some kind of power? Or is it something to satisfy a wound or maybe serve as a replacement for something deeper that we're missing or feeling in response to something in our life? Actually, simply put, an idol is when something or someone becomes more important to us than God. Even good things in our lives can become idols when we make them the most important thing in our lives. Now, over the course of these recent weeks, we've been looking at the stories found in Exodus following the Israelites' journey from slavery through the wilderness, all during a time when we too are experiencing kind of a, a form of wilderness. But just for review, Let's look at this. We, we've gone through um, the time when a new pharaoh arose and the Israelites of Joseph's time were no longer in favor and uh, had become slaves in the land of Egypt. And then we saw the infant Moses, how he was saved from death and grew in to be one who would lead the people out of slavery through the parting of the sea, right? And then wandering in search of food and lamenting for the need of water. But at each and every turn, when the people asked, God heard and responded. In today's portion of the story, Moses is gone. So they start to wonder. If they can't see evidence of God, they question if God really exists. And there are some of us may also feel that way too. Many people these days are fearful and restless, particularly isolated, and no one seems to have a clear answer for us when it's going to be safe to go to work or to travel on an airplane or even to sit indoors in a restaurant or be together again in our sanctuary space, right? We see our leaders in this country all in disagreement with one another over every and any issue that is presented before us, whether it's relating to the pandemic or to society, to the challenges of hunger and oppression within our communities. So who or what will keep us safe? The people of Israel are wondering the same thing in today's context of the story. So the golden statue seemed like the perfect object for worship. It was visible, not likely to wander off like Moses did. It was permanent, as permanent as anything can be, and would always remain the same. It wasn't going to change. It was a metal gold formed, molded statue. Well, think about that. Even now in the 21st century, we're really not all that different. We all have the potential to turn aside to one kind of golden calf or another. We all are prone to have idols. No one's exempt from that. I wonder have you ever thought if there were one that you might identify with? Where might you be focusing your attention in the wrong place? Could you perhaps tend to engage in some kind of contemporary form of idolatry as a means of, let's say, distraction or mental escape from our present reality? What may have been perceived as this bowing down to a golden calf in ancient times actually appears stunningly similar to claiming our identity in who and or what we serve or even how many of us define ourselves. I recently read an article that asked whether an item had the capacity, any item would have the capacity to do something bad to us, right? Um, or is it more likely that we do something awful to ourselves when we put 
or give our attention and focus to something that should really go to God. In other words, idolatry is not a danger found in an item or from an item. It is actually in us. Do any of us cling so tightly to our own certainties that we're unable to make space for questions or doubt or even at times healthy dialogue that includes listening and learning from different perspectives? Or have you turned your certainty into an idol? As Greg Boyd suggested in the earlier video that was shared as part of the message today. Beloved friends, in this time, know more than ever that our worth is valued on our relationship with God, not in the certainty of what it is that we believe. Just as Moses showed us, our ability to stay in the presence of God, to grow with God, meeting our anxieties face to face, questioning and wrestling with our doubts and promising to remain in relationship with God in response to the uncertainties in life. That, in fact, is what faith is. Living and loving and learning about that is bigger and better than whatever substitute may be out there. Know it to be so. Amen. Together, let us share in a time of prayer where we express our joys and concerns let us pray. God, we come into your presence with praise and thanksgiving for your faithful love, for your love never fails, not even when we turn away from you, when we ignore your invitation or desert you for gods of our own making. Even then, you do not abandon us, but reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship once more. As you welcome us, so you welcome our prayers. And we bring them to you with confidence, knowing that you will hear and answer. We pray for the world that you created and the people who share it with us. For all who are caught up in war or violent conflict. For regions of our world and our nation struggling with increased cases of COVID-19, for those homes and lives that are threatened by natural disasters, and for these and all other areas of our world where there is need and despair, we pray, God, that you hear this prayer. We pray for our country and for its people for our leaders, those in federal and local governments, for our judicial systems, for the police and the military in our cities and towns and rural communities, for employers and employees, both young and old, who are all part of this country. Lord, God, please hear our prayers this day. We pray for our local community, the people of Lyons Township, our neighbors, for those who are unemployed, for those who may be in prison, for those who may be hungry, for those who may be alone or afraid or isolated, for all our neighbors, those we know and those who are unknown to us. God, in your mercy, hear our prayers. We pray too for this congregation, for our brothers and sisters in Christ, for all those who are ill or those loved ones who are suffering, for those who may be anxious about the future, 
struggling with their faith, who live and work and love among us. For all your people in this place, God, hear our prayers. Pour out your spirit on us. Fix our hearts and minds on what is true and honorable and right. Give us the joy and peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. Keep us faithful to the call that we have received in Christ Jesus by extending a loving invitation to all those in the world around us. Together, let us pray in Jesus' name, using the words given to us so long ago, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Amen. Beloved friends, we know of Moses and how he stood in the breach between God and humanity, and it is our turn to do the same. So in generous love and offering, we ask that you give as an extension of God's love during this time. Let us pray in dedication of today's offering. Gracious God, receive the gift of our lives in this offering. 
the offering of our service to carry your love from this place to a world indeed in great need. This we pray in the name of Christ, whom with you and the Holy Spirit live in our hearts and lives, one God, now and forevermore. Amen. Friends, indeed, today has been a day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Go forth today, strengthened to do the work of Christ, standing in the gap, extending the invitation to the eternal banquet, rejoicing in God, and let your gentleness be known to everyone, and don't worry about anything. God, who created you, 
the Christ who redeems you, and the Spirit who empowers you is with you today and evermore every day. Now, let all God's people say, Amen.